Hey everybody, welcome to another little discussion of uh, a Rust topic. Today we're going to tackle one of the big mysteries of Rust, the sort of end of the line scariest bit. We're going to talk a little bit about unsafe today. Now, this doesn't have to be a huge deal. Um, unsafe Rust is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, it's sort of like still way way stronger than C in terms of what it enforces and yet in other ways it's comparable to C in that it allows you to have some freedom to sort of do things that s sometimes the Rust compiler can't tell are going to be okay and usually that's because they won't be okay but we'll talk about some of the exceptions as well so that's the plan for today is to actually take a look at some of the unsafe stuff and see what's going on so, if you've played with Rust at all, you've probably seen floating around somewhere this keyword unsafe. And you've learned that Rust turns off part of its checking at that point. We should be really super clear about, as we start out, about what the unsafe keyword can turn off. Because it isn't all that much. It's just a few things that get turned off when you say unsafe. One is that if a function is labeled unsafe, you can call it from inside unsafe code. That's a thing that's a possibility. Another is that there's a special type of pointer we'll be looking at later on, the raw pointers, which are different from Rust's normal references. They have stars instead of ampersand and look a lot more C-like. You can dereference those. Now notice that safe Rust can let you do pretty much anything with pointers except the thing where you actually try to find out what's being pointed to, and that's unsafe. You can mutate global variables. For various reasons, it's considered dangerous to have global mutable state, and so if you want to be able to mutate global state, you need unsafe to be in an unsafe context. And finally, uh, you can use some foreign function interface stuff. Every language wants to have a foreign function interface. Rust is no exception. But of course, the foreign language that we're calling into and getting results from that's calling into us maybe isn't going to have the same guarantees about what it's doing that Rust does. And so you're required to interact with it in an unsafe context in order to be able to do that. And that's it. Notice that in particular, the type checker does not get turned off. The borrow checker does not get turned off. None of the things that make Rust what it is get turned off. All that happens is we poke a few holes here and there so that you can do low level things that sometimes things get in the way of. So that's the story there. So if we do it wrong, in a Rust program, again, because we're in an unsafe setting, uh, Rust safety guarantees go away. Uh, it can be, normally with a Rust program, we're sort of guaranteed that the program will either run to completion producing answers or it will panic or otherwise exit in a controlled fashion, but it won't just do weird stuff. If you turn off the safety guarantees with unsafe, you now have the potential of undefined behavior. And undefined behavior is a weird term. It's a technical term. What we mean by that is that anything could happen. Uh, if you screw up and violate the rules of unsafe, which we'll spend a bunch of time talking about what those rules are here in a second, then Maybe your program will still work just fine. That's a possible behavior. Maybe your program will crash with a panic or with a core dump. Or maybe it'll write all over your disk. Or maybe it'll connect through the network and write all over somebody else's disk. It's literally undefined what the program will do. And it may do different things on different runs. And so it is highly discouraged to never get undefined behavior. But if the compiler is not protecting you from it, if you have to protect yourself, what are the things you don't, you're not allowed to do? Here's a few of them. You must never 
read uninitialized memory. In fact, that's probably a weak statement, a probably more accurate statement in the current combination of Rust and LLVM is you should never have accessible uninitialized memory, period, whether you read it or not. Uh, the There are obviously some exceptions to that, but the Rust compiler and the backend LLVM, the the code generator are really aggressive in their optimizations and they will assume that your memory is initialized unless you work really hard to tell them it isn't and so you can get in a lot of trouble with uninitialized memory so don't if you create invalid primitive values that's a kind of undefined behavior so what does that mean that's a fancy mouthful well so for example if your references ever get to be null or point anywhere that isn't the memory of the thing that of a, of a valid rest object that's an invalid primitive you can't put a box around that that whose inner pointer points some weird place uh bool values must always be internally either zero or one they're bite-sized values but you can't have them unlike c be two or five or anything they should always be either zero or one enum values with bogus discriminants what's a discriminant it's the internal number that is used by the compiler to represent the values of that enum so if you have an enum that has a is zero b is one c is two and somehow you have an enum value that's 17 well in unsafe mode i can create one of those but uh it's not it's undefined behavior and you shouldn't do it um Char values that are not Unicode code points. Uh, not all 32-bit integers are valid characters in Unicode. There's some that are off the top of the range. There are also some illegal ones in the middle of the range that are reserved code points. Don't put those in there. It's undefined behavior. It literally can cause your program to do weird things if those are ever dealt with. Um, string values, str string slice values, str values that are not UTF-8. Um, the string libraries and everything else assumes that it is valid UTF-8 and we don't know what will happen otherwise. Um, yeah, again, if you violate lifetimes, if you leave a dangling pointer, it's absolutely easy in unsafe code to leave a pointer dangling somewhere, a reference dangling somewhere. Um, it's absolutely easy to have two mutable references to the same thing. And the dangers here is that a lot of the time that code will work. It won't be obvious that you've got undefined behavior, but you'll have undefined behavior and potentially it could do anything at that point. Uh, we'll talk about, like I say, about raw pointers in a bit. If you dereference a pointer that points somewhere invalid, or in particular, if you have an alignment issue, which is a very common problem if your pointer isn't pointing to something aligned for the size of the type it's pointing at, then you can have undefined behavior. Um, data races, you're not going to be protect, as protected against those anymore because you've turned off a lot of the machinery. And there's unwinds across foreign function interface calls. Uh, don't worry about it. And violates contracts of any functions in the standard library, especially, but also elsewhere. If it violates those contracts, then, you know, it's going to be undefined behavior. Normally, if you're calling safe functions, you sort of can't violate their contracts from safe code, but you can from unsafe code. So there you are. Um, so that's sort of unsafety. And what that means is that, you know, so the, the culture, especially lately, there's been a lot of back and forth in the REST community about uh, what we mean by, uh, you know, what, what, what the status is of unsafe blocks, about whether the unsafe keyword is something that should basically never be used in Rust programs or used only with formal proofs or used only in situations. You know, there's a lot of sort of squeamishness about this keyword, and that's absolutely legitimate because one of goals that's very explicit in Rust is the goal of being safe and unsafe blocks sort of you know, endanger that. 
And so what is it that we need to promise we will do if we're going to convince people that the unsafe code we've used is something that belongs in programs? Because that is possible. Um, first of all, it's really impossible. So let's talk first about the case of an unsafe function. And in that case, you have to write your code so that when the function is used according to the rules you've set out, undefined behavior can't occur. And what are those conditions? Because, you know, obviously there must be some ways in which the function can be used that would be unsafe or it wouldn't be an unsafe function. Uh, you write out a contract. At the top of the, th of the function should be a dot comment that says these are the circumstances under which you can safely call this unsafe function. And it should be the case that it uh, absolutely will never cause undefined behavior if you use it the way that comment says. You need to check that. You need to verify that for yourself. And then the next thing is, well, what if it's not an unsafe function? What if it's just an unsafe block inside a supposedly safe function? Then things are even scarier, and it's absolutely obligatory that uh, the no valid call to the function can cause undefined behavior. There, there can't be. You can't write a function, a contract for a safe function. You have to assume that. It could be called in any way that safe rust can legally call it. And under those circumstances, you have to be able to prove that your supposedly safe function actually will not be UB. And that's one of the requirements when you put an unsafe block in a function. If you can't prove that to yourself and to everyone else who asks, then you shouldn't put an unsafe block in there. Let's look at an example of an unsafe function real fast. This is a standard string from UTF-8 unchecked. We've talked about it before. This thing takes a slice of bytes, a whole bunch of U8s, and says, assume that that's actually a string slice. That is, assume that the contents of those bytes are valid UTF-8. So this is a conversion function. And it's a conversion function that's marked unsafe because, again, it's undefined behavior if I don't um, if I don't uh, pass in something that's valid UTF-8 as that string of bytes. And so if I were, for example, to read a file con file's contents into a slice of bytes and then use this to turn it into a string, if I'm right in my confident assertion that the file was actually a UTF-8 legal text file, then no problem. If I'm not, well, what could happen? Literally anything. I literally don't know what will happen after that. So we got to be careful about it. We got to be really careful about it. In practice, it'll probably work most of the time until it doesn't, um, and then the bad thing will happen. And that's what's scary about this. So let's look at the source code to from UTF-8 unchecked. And notice that the first thing that's here is that thing we saw in the dot comment, safety. This function is unsafe because it does not check that the bytes are valid UTF-8. If this constraint is violated, undefined behavior results. So this is everything I just said verbally in the form of a dot comment. And that dot comment tells you what the contract of the function is. It says you must uh, pass in only valid UTF-8 byte slices. Then let's look at the implementation. Stick the unsafe keyword in the front. That makes it an unsafe function. And then we just do a bunch of casts. We say, well, you know, and notice that in unsafe code, in an unsafe function, sort of the whole body of the function is considered to be unsafe. And I can, I have all the unsafe special powers. I can call unsafe functions. I can uh, dereference pointers, blah, blah. Here, I don't need to use much of any of that, right? I have do this one funny ampersand star here, which is just uh, converting a pointer into a slice. And the, where did I get that pointer? Well, I took this pointer, 
I cast it into a slice of a, from a slice of U8s to a pointer to the U8s. Then I cast that to a stir pointer. And these in unsafe or perfectly legitimate casts. And now I go ahead and convert that resulting pointer. I star ampersand it. That is, I dereference it, the thing that unsafe allows me to do, and then take the address of that dereference. So I'm not actually dereferencing it at all. And now I've got a valid ampersand stir. Um, one of the things I gotta be super careful about here is what's happening with the borrow checker. It's an interesting question, right? Because it looks on the face of it, it's not obvious that anything's going on. Remember I said the borrow checker isn't turned off in unsafe code? We still have the constraint that whatever the lifetime was of this slice, then implicitly the lifetime of this is the same. So we could put a tick A here and put a tick A here and put a tick A here and we'd get the same answer. So there you are, an unsafe function. Woohoo. Now, you don't, unsafe isn't just something you put in front of functions. You also have unsafe blocks. And the unsafe block should also have a contract. And I would recommend, in my own code these days, I write a two part contract for my unsafe block. Uh, and really, this is a good idea for functions also, but especially for blocks. First part. Why, why do I need an unsafe block here? I need an explanation of why there isn't some simple thing that I can do with a reasonable thing that I can do with safe code instead of sticking an unsafe block there that will achieve the same thing. And that's important because people are really suspicious of unsafe blocks and you wanna articulate a really clear, plausible reason why you're using one in an environment that's pretty paranoid about it. And the second thing is the same safety question. How can I prove that, you know, what is my argument that nothing in here can actually cause undefined behavior in practice? And so if I have a contract like that around my, above my unsafe block, then maybe I'm good to go with my unsafe block. And again, the need's super important. Please don't use an unsafe block until all other reasonable alternatives have been considered and discarded. You know, typically tiny performance penalty, you know, tiny, tiny performances, tiny, tiny speed ups. Eh, don't, don't use an unsafe block. Just take the tiny performance hit. It'll be fine unless you can really demonstrate it matters to something real. Um, typically uh, simplifying the code. No, not really. It's going to be much easier for me to believe code when I can believe the compiler checks, even if it's pretty complicated than code where I have to do all the checking mentally by hand or some of the checking mentally by hand. Um, I've been talking a lot about pointers. I should um, be more explicit about this. So a type we haven't talked about much so far is this type of pointers. And they're just like references, except they aren't. A pointer is like a C pointer. It's supposed to always either point toward, to the start of some Rust valid Rust object, or be null. Null is, unlike references, which can never be null in Rust, pointers can actually be null, and uh, you have to respect that, that thing being a possibility. And unlike Rust uh, references, the compiler isn't checking that they always point someplace legitimate. Um, the The, um, sorry about the interruption. The, uh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. The, they, they could be pointing anywhere. And in fact, in embedded programming, for example, it's really common to make pointers point at some machine register in memory somewhere. And, uh, So there's that. So I should be clear, from safe code, I can initialize these pointers, pass these pointers around, I can do anything with them. The raw pointers are absolutely safe. The only operation that it requires unsafe is actually finding out what's at the other end of the pointer, actually dereferencing them. Um, 
I should be clear that Rust has no raw pointer arithmetic. You can't do pointer plus value. Um, so instead, there's some functions in the standard library for that. Let's take a little look at a little example at this point. So here's a function that plays with some pointers. I'm going to start with p being a null pointer, which is an absolutely legitimate thing for it to be. And you'll notice I'm using some function from standard to get the nullness. I could also just say uh, zero is const char pointer, um, but then I'll get a warning from Clippy saying, hey, you know, you're really supposed to use this built-in function, so whatever. So we will see if null is zero on this machine, which it is. We'll check to make sure the pointer is null, which it is. Then we'll add one to the pointer. So one what is the obvious answer. Um, we'll add one of something to the pointer, print it again, and then we'll dereference it. Now at this point, you know, probably it's not going to be reasonable that P is pointing any place plausible, right? It started out at zero presumptively and is now just a little bit more than zero somehow. And uh, under those circumstances, this probably isn't actually safe. And so this unsafe block, which you'll notice has no justification and no safety guarantees like I told you you should have, is probably going to cause some kind of undefined behavior. Will it print something? Will it crash? Will it wipe my hard disk? Well, actually, it's running on the playground. Will it wipe the playground's hard disk? Only one way to find out. So we run it. Oh, look at that. Segmentation fault. Oh, oh, oh. Um, so it actually seg faults because the monitored command dumped core, and it sort of shows up as a timeout, but it says, yeah, you know what? That last line, I didn't like that so much. So we find out that the null pointer really is zero. We find out that is null is true. And when we add one, and this took me a moment, right? The pointer is now four. Why four? I was like, wow, you know, it's char. It's a char pointer, so I should only add one. And um, yet here I am adding four. Uh, so what happened? And then I remembered, oh yeah, right, right, Rust. Chars are not bytes like they are in C. Chars and Rust are Unicode characters, so it apparently adds one unit of whatever type the pointer is, just like a C pointer would, so that's kind of nice. And I use wrapping add here because it's safe. There are various other pointer addition arithmetic operators that are not safe, and you can go look in standard pointer for a whole bunch of pointer manipulation stuff. Anyway, when we get to the end, yay, undefined behavior, we dump core, which is exactly what we don't want. But of course, if we'd made this point somewhere sensible, if we had, for example, said this, um, char c equals a, um, and then we'd said p equals ampersand c, then let's see what happens when we compile and run this. Oh, let char c, let c equal a. I don't know what I'm doing here. Wow. Okay, let's try that again. Let c equal a, blah, blah. It compiles, runs, and it says, sure. Now p is pointing at an a, and that's an absolutely legitimate thing to do. In fact, if... Um, I do this, let's have some fun here. If I go C is A, B, um, I can, it turns out that for slices, there's a thing called as pointer. And um, I think it's gonna tell me that the pointer is the wrong type. Let's find out. Yeah, mismatched types, found U8, right, right, right. Um, uh, as, const pointer u8, or char I mean. Oh no, because this is UTF-8 text, right? This isn't gonna work at all, my bad. All right, so let's let's fix this to be the sensible people way of this, I see. My bad. Um, 
let's make this an array instead with a couple characters in it right there again right nice lesson in utf8 versus uh, other things here now let's see if that runs and now you'll notice i still get my a because this thing is a pointer to the start of this slice but I can also do the obvious thing. I can add some more to it. Let's look at the next one and print it again. And notice that there's not, oops. Notice that there's not a lot of unsafe happening here, right? This is not, um, the only unsafe is where I actually dereference this pointer and everything else. It's like, yeah, whatever. It's just you're playing with pointers. Have fun with that as long as you don't dereference them. And notice that this is absolutely legal. It is absolutely a thing to do. Of course, we know that we know that that array was only of length two. This raw pointer doesn't isn't a fat pointer. It's always a skinny pointer. So let's see what happens if we walk off the end. Um, what's past the end of that array? Oh, some non-character. Notice that this time we didn't dump core. This time we got whatever the four bytes are after our array interpreted as a character. Undefined behavior, right? Who knows what's there? Who knows what it's going to do? Could we have dumped core? Absolutely. Um, there we are. That's unsafe for you. And that's pointers for you. So. So, like I say, all these pointers, unlike Rust's um, references, are skinny pointers. They're just an address or null. And they don't own anything. Um, the borrow checker absolutely is uninterested in what your pointer is pointing at. It assumes that it's pointing at nothing interesting at all. So, you know, you got to watch out. If you um, take a reference and store it in a pointer and then drop the reference, well, the borrow checker is gonna run and drop your value that's being referred to if you're not careful. And so you really wanna be careful about that. Um, you should watch out for the fact that if I convert a pointer to a reference, yes, I can absolutely cast a pointer back to a reference, but I should probably explicitly specify the lifetime because by default, the reference data is going to have a static lifetime. Also, that pointer better have been pointing to a thing that actually is on the heap so that when it gets dropped, you know, well, sorry, it won't be dropped because it's just a reference you're getting back. But the point is you want to be really careful about how you do that. It's a really dangerous operation. So having said all that, let's look at a couple examples. Here's a nice example from the book that we can look at. The, the book has a really nice discussion around this ref with flag idea. And the idea of this example is that if I have a pointer on a machine with an alignment of, you know, where, where, where the values have to be aligned, right? We've, we haven't talked much about alignment in this class. You probably have, some of you probably haven't seen it since 201. What's the idea of alignment? Well, two byte size things typically on a machine, modern machine have to be at even address, start at even addresses. Four byte size things have to start at addresses that are a multiple of four. That's called alignment. And a consequence of alignment requirements is that pointers, valid Rust pointers for things of two bytes or more will have some guaranteed zero bits down at the bottom, right? If the address that uh, a thing starts at is a multiple of two, that means that it's an even address, which means that the low order bit of that pointer is gonna be a zero, guaranteed. And that seems wasteful, right? Now you got a bit that isn't really being used for anything because it's always gonna be zero for every kind of two byte object. Heck, with four byte objects, you waste two bits, and with eight byte objects, you waste three whole bits. That's very wasteful. So maybe we can do something with that. Maybe we can steal this. And this is a very classic systems hack. I've done this in C a billion times, but C makes it really easy because C doesn't really care about pointers or types or anything very much. It's perfectly happy to have you mung around the pointers and if you do something dumb, well, it's on you. 
here we're going to try to make a nice, safe, rust way of borrowing the low order bit of some reference. And so that's what this ref with flag module is going to do. Here's a, and we're going to use phantom data, which is one of those things that keeps coming up, which is a little weird. And we're going to use something called standard mem align of, which tells me for the object, for some given type, what's the required alignment of that type. So I'm going to sit here and make a struct and the struct really is a pointer, but you'll notice that I'm not representing it as a pointer. Now this was um, the book author's choice. I think I might have represented it as a pointer, but they chose not to. They chose to represent it as a U size. That is a pointer together with a bit on the bottom. And all pointers are guaranteed to fit in U sizes. That's sort of the definition of U size. So that should be okay. And then um, we have this funny phantom data constraint. Now remember, phantom datas don't occupy any storage. They're just there to provide a constraint on the behavior. And in this case, what it's trying to do is make the struct track the type of things stored in it. Because this U size doesn't track anything, right? There's no type information there. So this U size here, T, this T here needs to be remembered by the compiler. And the way we do that is we say, oh, yeah, yeah, this U size is really kind of like a reference um, with this lifetime to a T, right? So that now we have a lifetime, we have the lifetime, we have a type, we have the type. And so now this struct ref with flag carries around a lifetime and a type, even though the only data stored in it is U size. So that's kind of cool. So that's the most magic magic, really. Now we're just going to implement that struct. We're going to provide a new method, which sort of does a thing, given a, a reference with a given lifetime. Uh, why does lifetime alignment work there? I, a lot elision work there. I would have put tick AT. But anyway, um, the... We get, a, we get a reference, we get a bit. This is the extra bit that we're gonna borrow. We make sure, first of all, notice that we will panic at runtime. This is not unsafe. We will panic at runtime if uh, the alignment of our type is not even alignment. And notice that that is a runtime check at this point. Um, the compiler, at least notionally, will not notice, there's no compile time assertions in Rust, and so there's no way for me to have it check at compile time. Uh, one can imagine, mm, one can imagine a lot of things. I kind of think that's the best you can do without a lot of fooling around. So having verified that our, our addresses have a spare bit to borrow, we're now gonna go ahead and take our, our reference that was passed in, turn it into a pointer because nothing stops you from making pointers. Turn that into a U size because Rust does, the compiler doesn't really care even in safe code if you make that transition. And then we're gonna take that U size and we're gonna or it with our bit as U size. And casting a Boolean to a U size gives you either zero if the Boolean was false or one if it's true. We also have to include this to make the compiler happy. Um, that matches this phantom data field that we're not ever going to use for anything again. Now, if we want to get the reference out, what do we do? Hey, this is the only place we actually have to do something unsafe. We take our pointer and bit. We mask off the bottom bit, right? The one that we know is supposed to be zero. And we cast that all to a const pointer to a type T. And now, um, look at it, it's that trick again, right? I need the unsafe because I'm gonna dereference the pointer, but I'm just gonna take the address again. And now I get back a lifetime. Notice a reference. Notice that I've been careful to constrain that lifetime of reference, of, of that reference. Constrain it to what? 
constrain it to the lifetime here in the impl that's the lifetime of the ref with flag and that is because the phantom data is going to do the right thing it says oh yeah 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 we're going to we're going to enforce that it's going to be all good now the other thing i might want out is the boolean well that's really easy right pointer and bits already a u size and so I just mask off the lower bit and check to see if it's zero. If it's zero, then I return false. If it's one, I return true. It doesn't get any easier than that. Here's the test for this. We're going to um, go ahead and make a vector. We're going to make a ref with flag out of a reference to that vector. And we're going to initialize the flag to be true. Uh, Notice that we can get out the reference here. We can do this. Notice that this isn't a complete interface. It would be really nice to be able to toggle the flag um, uh, rather than just carry it around. But you know, it's a start. So that's that example. Let's look at, uh, I don't think I wanna look at the SI Vec example. It's been a while and I feel like we should move on. Anyway, this is a piece of code you can look at at your leisure that I wrote that does some more fancy things with um, unsafe and in fact has some fairly complicated invariants. I currently believe this code is full of UB because the memory rules have become more clear over time and I think I violate them. But um, I've tried really hard not to and to uh, sort of anytime you see an unsafe block Here's my sort of safety thing for the unsafe block. And here's sort of the, the a place where I, this really is unsafe and I'm not sure what to do about it. Um, so, yeah. The last thing I wanna talk about, and then we'll be done for this topic is foreign function interface. So it turns out that the way the foreign function interface is for providing or accepting C-like calling conventions is I can declare externs just like I can in most languages. I have to turn off name mangling just like I do in C++. In standard OS is a whole bunch of stuff for C type and value conversions. Remember in particular that Rust strings are not C strings. Rust strings are count characters and the characters are stored as UTF-8. C strings are um, null terminated and that means that null is not a valid character inside strings. And so we have to be a little careful when we're passing strings back and forth that everything's going to be cool. I really don't want to do the full grind today on foreign function interface, but let's just take a look at a really small example just to get a feel for uh, what this looks like. So and this is a very trivial example. Um, here's rusty.com. RS. So this thing is just a really, really simple demo. Let's start by building it and saying mixy and it prints 25. Woohoo, we've printed 25. That's exciting. But notice that this is a bunch of C and Rust code being linked together with the C compiler. So take a look what happens here. I compiled some C code. I compile some Rust code and I compile the Rust code into a .o file, just like you would with C. And then in the last step, I use the C linker, Clang's linker, to link these two .o files into an executable. So let's see how that all works. So here's the C code that I'm interested in. It turns out I'm letting the C drive this time. It's got the main program. So I got the usual pound includes and blah, blah. And then I've got this extern int32t. Remember int32t is like um, i32 in Rust. It's the 32-bit integer type. Rust add int32t int32t. I have cmol, which is a local function. Um, that's pretty boring. And then I have main, which calls Rust add. Okay, and prints the result. So we're just passing numbers around. This is about as simple as the cases get. Let's take a look at rusty.rs. 
wow there's some interesting things in here crate type equals static lib meaning don't um don't try to be clever and build a dynamic library don't try to be clever and build a binary this is just sort of library code we have no std and no built-ins now no std means don't link against the standard library don't bring in the standard library prelude that means that stuff in the standard library which is some stuff you really care about including things like vec are not available to you in this code um, I also chose no built-ins, which is even stronger. It says that a whole bunch of stuff that's built into the compiler gets turned off too. My goal here is to make a very small, simple .o file, much like what I would get um, if I compiled a C program. So what have I got here? Well, I've got an external reference. It says, oh, there's a function called cmol out there that takes an i32 and, a, and another i32 and returns an i32. And indeed there is, right? That was the thing we saw in the ce function. This is cmol, right? So I'm saying that's out there. Now, here's a no mangle pub extern system fun wow that's a lot of things so what is extern system pub obviously means that it's visible outside this file extern system means that i use the calling conventions that are on whatever system i'm compiling for and then this is just a function rust add now rust add is really really badly named to the point where i really should um um I really should change it at some point. Um, but it takes a couple I32s, it adds them together, it calls cmol to, to square the result, right? So if you'll remember back here in CE, we said rust add two and three, and now we can see what's going on. We go two plus three is five, so z is five. Then we call cmol to multiply five with itself, returning 25. And back there where I called rust add, yep, sure enough, it printed 25, just like it was supposed to. Notice that this is unsafe. It's unsafe because we don't know whether, um, you know, what the C, what cmol is gonna do. It could do pretty much anything. And so we're required to mark it as unsafe to indicate here's a place where we're calling external code. What does no mangle do? It keeps this name in the object file the way it is instead of mangling it to capture type information. This is a pretty standard thing. The last weird thing that's here is what's called a panic handler. I'm not actually sure we need this anymore. Let's comment it out and see if it builds. I kind of think we still do. Oh, sorry, make. Yeah, it's like, eh, you don't have a panic handler. So what is the deal with the panic handler? The panic handler here is the thing that um, is called when your Rust code panics. And in this case, I'm not, I'm making it do nothing. I'm just making it loop, which is a terrible implementation, but there we are, there we are. So that is FFI. I've, I've declared a Rust function and called it from C. I've declared a C function and called it from Rust. Uh, and that gives you a little bit of an idea of where unsafe starts to appear in this picture. So hopefully that was a useful introduction. Hopefully you're now a little bit more comfortable with uh, what it means to deal with unsafe code. And if you have questions, as always, I'm really super happy to hear them. So thank you for listening. Take care.